Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. I am a lover of horror films. I am a lover of scary stories and terrifying tales and all things dark and spooky. I haven't always been. I used to believe that the devil was waiting around every corner and that I had to be very careful or he could do bad things to me. I lost that belief and when I did, I took back control over my own feelings and emotions and part of that meant delving into things I used to be afraid of. Releasing all of those fears was very empowering for me and I'm not afraid anymore. The only thing I fear is man. Well, okay, maybe bears. I've always been a little bit afraid of bears. <laughs> But you can avoid getting killed and eaten by a bear, right? You can't always avoid getting killed by a human being. So for me, man is the only thing to be truly afraid of. We're talking a lot about religion today, and quite a few of you have asked about my beliefs in the comments and on Patreon. I think because I've spoken about being an ex-Mormon, and I have no problem telling you, I consider myself agnostic. That means I simply do not know if there is life after death. Although I would like to think there is, and I suspect there might be, but I just don't know. And if there is life after death, I personally don't believe it looks anything like it does in religion. But agnostic just means I don't claim to know what I believe to be unknowable. I don't believe in prophets, I don't believe in superpowers that include talking to a god no one else gets to see, and I don't believe that any of us need to be led by someone who claims to have a magical connection to God. I think we are all equal in the most fundamental of ways. And I think that if there is life after death, and there is some point to all of this, putting people who know about that on earth to lead us or direct us would totally and completely invalidate the entire experiment, the entire point. Anyway, I figured this was a good episode to answer that question that many of you have asked about me, because today we are talking about everyone's favorite scapegoat, the devil. What would we do without the good old devil to blame for bad behavior, for people who leave religion, for the wars and the conflicts that man creates? He's just good for so many things, right? The devil is very important to our society because every story needs a great and powerful villain. Because without a villain, there could be no hero. And how we love our heroes. Today we are talking about legends, religion, and folklore gone too far. This is one of the only times in history where a case of demonic possession made its way into the court system. This is the story of the possession of Annalisa Michel. Let's get into it. Anna Elizabeth Michel was born on September 21st, 1952 in Bavaria. She and her three sisters were raised by very strict Roman Catholic parents. Annalisa attended Mass twice a week and went to confessional often. She was somewhat frail. She wasn't necessarily a sickly child, but she wasn't a hearty, active child either. She seemed to get more childhood illness than her sisters. If the whole family caught a cold or the flu, the illness always seemed to affect Annalisa more severely and for a longer period of time than her siblings and parents. And when she was a teenager, the family found out why. When Annalisa was 16 years old, she experienced a very serious seizure. There had been some episodes before this seizure that were most likely small seizures, but they were nothing compared to what happened when Annalisa was 16. She was at school when suddenly she began to act strangely. Annalisa was walking around in a daze and she wasn't responding to her classmates. And then she fell on the floor and began to convulse. The seizure was so severe that Annalisa was injured and she didn't recover fully for days. Her parents sought medical treatment and Annalisa was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. TLE is a chronic disorder of the nervous system. The seizures that it causes come on without warning or provocation. People that have TLE have often experienced head injuries, strokes, or brain infections. TLE can also be an indicator for a brain tumor. There are more than 40 types of epilepsy, and TLE is the most common form of focal seizures, which account for about 60% of all cases of epilepsy. When people with TLE have a seizure, they are conscious. They just can't control what their body is doing. They may experience deja vu before the seizure. They may often get a sense of fear and anxiety. Sometimes they get nauseous and vomit, and they often experience hallucinations. 
It is not uncommon for people with TLE to have schizophrenia and other mental disorders like dissociation and often euphoria. It's a debilitating condition that can most often be controlled with medication, but not always. I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that people who have a brain injury that develop TLE, and this brain injury doesn't have to be serious, it can be something as mild as a concussion in childhood that they don't even get medical treatment for, those people can develop something called Geschwind syndrome. The hallmarks of Geschwin syndrome are a disappearance of the sex drive, hypergraphia, which is an intense drive to write or draw all the time, and most importantly for our case today, hyper-religiosity. About a year after Annalisa's first seizure, it happened again. She woke up in her bed in the middle of a seizure. She lost control of her bladder and was shaking uncontrollably for several minutes. Annalisa was upset about this second seizure because she had been told with medication that she may not have another seizure. So I'm sure this was very depressing for her, such a young girl to be dealing with such a serious ailment, right? Annalisa was prescribed a lantern, but it did not help her. Her anxiety grew and she became a very, very nervous and upset young woman. Her doctor prescribed Aolept, which is similar to Thorazine, and for a while that seemed to calm her nerves. But then, as it often does, it brought on periods of psychosis. Even with everything she was experiencing, Annalisa went off to college at the University of Würzburg in Germany. She began attending in 1973. She wanted to have a normal college experience and with the help of her neurologist and the medication the doctor prescribed, everyone believed that was possible. Immediately upon arrival at university, Annalisa's classmates realized that she was not a normal college student. She wasn't interested in boys or parties or college activities. Annalisa's classmates describe her as shy, as very quiet and very withdrawn. They also say that she was incredibly religious, the most religious person any of them knew. Annalisa spent a lot of time going to Mass, and when she wasn't at Mass, she was either in class or alone in her dorm reading the scriptures. The more time Annalisa spent alone and the more stress she experienced at college trying to keep her grades up while dealing with her illness, the more religious she became, and then she took a turn for the worse. Annalisa began to hear voices. These were not kind and friendly voices, these were terrible voices, telling her that she was damned. The voices told Annalisa that she was going to rot in hell for her thoughts and her disobedience. So Annalisa became more obedient. She began going to church almost daily, and she read her Bible whenever she wasn't studying or in class. It didn't help. In fact, things got worse. Soon, Annalisa began telling her family members that she was seeing the face of the devil everywhere she went. If someone passed her on campus, she would stare intently at their face and said it always turned into the face of the devil. She would even see the devil on TV and in magazines. And then the devil started talking to Annalisa. Now, let's stop for just a moment here. Obviously, Annalisa was experiencing symptoms of mental illness. Full disclosure here, I have no problem talking about this. I have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. It only really manifests itself when I get very, very chemically depressed. And now at 52 years old, I know how to deal with those things. I can feel the depression coming on. I up my Lexapro and I don't get the OCD. Back in the 1980s, we didn't talk about depression at all, and we sure as hell didn't talk about it in Mormon Cedar City, Utah. The answer for everything was to pray and read your scriptures. But after I had my first baby at 18, I suffered not only postpartum depression, but what is now called postpartum psychosis. I won't go into all the detail and bore you with the detail on that. I'm happy to talk about it on a live, or if you guys are interested, you can ask me. But my mom, to her credit, even in the 1980s and even in small town Mormon, Utah, took me to a counselor. I remember the shame and horror I felt running from the car into the counselor's office because I didn't want anyone in town to see me walking into the counselor's office. It was like shameful and humiliating. <laughs> now I would go to counseling every day if I could afford to. I love counseling. <laughs> so silly, the things we get worked up about. But on that first day, I spent about 30 minutes with this counselor and he sent me directly to a psychiatrist. 
Now, my little town in Utah only had access to a traveling psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Benny, and he was about 237 years old. But the next time he came into town, a few days after my appointment with the counselor, I saw him, and I was completely convinced, you guys, I even packed a bag. I thought when I went and told him the thoughts that were running through my head, he was gonna throw me in jail, or like hospital jail. And instead, he looked at me and just said, you have harm OCD and you're severely depressed. And he gave me a prescription of Prozac and in about two weeks, I was significantly better. Like I was ready for the white coat. I was ready for the padded room. I was being hauled off to hospital jail. <laughs> and the psychiatrist was like, oh no, you have this. Here's some medicine. <laughs> But I have strong opinions on this. You're shocked, I know, that I have an opinion on something. Had I listened to the church leaders that I was talking to about this and not gone and gotten medical treatment, I am not being facetious here. I don't know if I'd be here right now. I was pretty far gone and I didn't want to live like that. And yeah, I, I was not in good shape. So before you come at me for my strong opinions on religion and how untrained people in leadership positions in the church aren't qualified to give mental health counseling, just know that those opinions were formed from very painful personal experience. I am speaking as someone who went through that. I was told to pray, I was told to read my scriptures, and I was very seriously ill. And yeah, I'm a little bit angry about it still. But I speak from experience, and this is something that I have remained very involved in. I am still involved in the cause of stopping clergy from acting as mental health advisors. Not because I hate religion, not because I have a problem with people who want to go to church, but because it's dangerous. If you want to go to church and you find peace in religion, I'm happy for you. I think that's wonderful for you. And I will fight to the death for you to always have access to your religious church, to your convictions. It's just not something that I believe in, but I will always respect your decisions and fight for your right to belong to whatever church you want. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, we should all be allowed to do whatever we want. Anyway, that's just a really brief overview of my battle with mental illness. And it really made me feel for Annalisa because I know how she felt. I know in a way that most people don't what it's like to sit in your room all along and have terrible thoughts and think, I can't tell anyone what I'm thinking. They'll think I'm a horrible person. They'll think I'm sick. I was sick. There is no shame in mental illness and there is no shame in saying you want treatment. Well, sadly for Annalisa, it was the 1970s and she was from a very religious background and she was not able to say, I am sick and she was not able to get treatment. Instead, Annalisa sought help from her priests. She told them that she was possessed by a demon and that she saw the devil everywhere she went. Now, to some of their credit, there were a couple of priests that told Annalisa she needed medical treatment. Some listened to her and somewhat entertained her ideas, but surprisingly, in a good way, she was told she needed to see a doctor. So Annalisa continued to seek out different priests that were more in line with her thinking, that believed she was possessed by a demon. Even those priests told her that they couldn't get involved in any type of demonic possession without the permission of a bishop. And at that point, no priest was willing to ask a bishop for that type of permission. Then Annalisa stopped going to church altogether because she said that when she was in a church or in the presence of a crucifix, it caused her pain. During her first year at college, Annalisa visited a friend of hers in San Damiano, which is in Italy. This friend of hers regularly organized and put on Christian pilgrimages to strengthen the faith of those who wished to participate. Annalisa went on one of those pilgrimages with her friend, and as they walked through some of the holy sites, this friend became convinced that Annalisa was possessed by a demon because whenever she got close to a crucifix, Annalisa was unable to walk. Annalisa also refused to drink the water at a Christian holy spring that was part of the pilgrimage. Still, she could not convince a priest to perform an exorcism. Annalisa's family and friends and even members of her community were convinced that she was possessed. They said Annalisa couldn't even look at a picture of a saint because it glowed too brightly and it hurt her eyes. They said that she was unable to enter a shrine or a church and that if she tried, the dirt under her feet burned like fire. They said that when they prayed in the presence of Annalisa, she said the praying sounded like screaming and gnashing of teeth and that she simply could not tolerate any of it. 
Feeling hopeless and believing she was possessed, Annalisa's behavior then became very, very extreme. I think this was her cry for help. I do think she was wanting help. She was just lost in her clouded thinking because she was suffering with mental disease, but she wasn't incoherent. She just knew something was wrong and she couldn't get help for what she believed was wrong with her possession. I personally believe that there was a part of her that thought, oh, you don't think I'm possessed? Well, watch this. 1973. In the first episode of Extreme Behavior, Annalisa tore off all of her clothing. She screamed and tore at her hair, and it took everything her mother had to calm her down. Then the behavior got gross. Annalisa started to drink her own urine. She would catch spiders and bugs and shove them into her mouth. One day, as her mother tried to sit with her outside in the sunshine, Annalisa was able to catch a live bird, which, by the way, only further convinced her mother that she had some sort of special powers. And to her mother's horror, Annalisa held the bird, put its head in her mouth, and bit it off, Aussie style. On one occasion, Annalisa's mother found her in the basement eating coal. Again, that was probably so she would look shocking, you know, like she'd have black stuff coming out of her mouth. I do believe she was sick and that she needed help, but I also believe that she was really drawn to or kind of fixated on things that would make her appear demonic to those around her. And I think that was part of her cry for help, as well as part of her own delusions. It's really very sad. At this point, Annalisa's family was desperate. Her mother had spoken with all the priests in the area, but she had been given the names of some others that people thought might help. Finally, she found this man, Father Ernst Alt, and he said he was willing to help. Annalisa began writing to Father Alt. In one of her letters, she wrote, I am nothing. Everything about me is vanity. What should I do? I have to improve. You pray for me. She also wrote, I want to suffer for other people, but this is so cruel. Annalisa and Father Alt wrote letters back and forth throughout 1973, 74, and 75. During that time, Annalisa began taking Tegretol, which is a mood stabilizer and anti-seizure drug. She was also taking several antipsychotic drugs and often incorporated overdoses of those drugs into her religious rites. The medications did not have the desired effect on Annalisa, which to her family and believers only served as further proof that she wasn't ill, she was in fact possessed. Father Alt and Annalisa's family and friends believed that she was now possessed with several demons, including Adolf Hitler, Cain from the Bible, Judas Iscariot, Nero, and a man named Valentin Fleischmann, who was a priest in the 1500s who was defrocked for being a drunk, among other things. I always chuckle a little bit when people who claim to remember their past lives, they're never like a village housewife who took in washing for extra money. <laughs> <laughs> they're Helen of Troy, they're Cleopatra, they're Napoleon. You know, they're always someone very, very special. And in these possession stories, you find the same thing. The demons are always very famous demons. They're not like Herbert the pervert, who was a really bad guy on 36th and Oak in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> they're rulers and kings and dictators and, you know. All right, I'll shut up now. Father Alt was genuinely concerned for Annalisa, and it does seem like he wanted to help. I'm sure he felt for her family and saw that she was suffering. But also, I know enough about the Catholic Church, which is just like most churches, that I know the men in leadership positions, some of them really like a lot of power and clout. Some of them like feeling like a rock star in their religious world. They like the adoration and the responsibility and the power. So in the Catholic religion, you know, a priest that discovers a possession, you know, it doesn't get any bigger than that. I don't know Father Alt's motives. I'm just saying that it's a big deal to get the go ahead for an exorcism. And that is just what Father Alt set out to do. September, 1975. Father Ernst Alt finally convinces this man, Bishop Joseph Stengel, to grant permission for an exorcism. 
Father Alt and Bishop Stengel had been meeting in private to discuss Annalisa Michelle and what to do about her. It took Father Alt quite a bit of time to convince Bishop Stengel to give him permission for the exorcism, but he finally did on the condition that it be performed according to Ritual Romanum, the liturgical book that contains instructions on how to perform an exorcism, and that the exorcism be carried out in total secrecy. Bishop Stengel brought this man into the conversation. This is Father Arnold Renz, and Bishop Stengel trusted Father Renz to oversee the exorcism along with Father Alt, who would be assisting. Father Renz agreed to perform the exorcism, and with that, Annalisa's fate was sealed. On September 24th, 1975, it was time. Father Renz and Father Alt went to the home of Joseph and Anna Michelle, who had been caring for Annalisa full time for years now as she spiraled and wasted away. That day, they began performing what would become a series of 67 exorcism sessions. Like, fellas, did they think the 68th would be the charm? I mean, <sighs> the two priests began the ritual as Annalisa lay in bed. The first session was disturbing. Annalisa would moan and speak in a low tone and glower at the people in the room. It lasted about four hours, but Annalisa's behavior and condition did not improve. So the priests began returning to the Michelle home day after day, week after week for almost an entire year. They would arrive at the Michelle home one or two days a week and each time they would conduct a four hour exorcism session. After a couple of months of this, things had progressed to an unbelievable level of ridiculousness. I just have to say it as it is. It may have felt real to the people involved at the time, but shouldn't there have come a point where they realized this wasn't working? I'm going to show you the condition Annalisa was in. It's horrible. She grew pale and thin. She lost all of her body fat. She developed dark circles around her eyes and her teeth began to rot because she did not brush them. She did not bathe. She refused to eat much of anything and it was always a battle to get her to drink even a little water. The exorcism sessions grew increasingly dramatic and disturbing and many of them were recorded. I'm going to play you a couple of minutes of those recordings. They're obviously in German, and I don't normally play clips that are longer than about 30 seconds, but I want you to listen, if you don't speak German, which I don't, to Annalisa and the changes her voice goes through. It's quite convincing. Yeah. Ja, 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 In one exorcism session, Annalisa, speaking as Hitler, one of the demons they believed possessed her, said, 
People are stupid as pigs. They think it's all over after death. It goes on. Then Judas entered the chat and replied to Hitler. And Judas said, Hitler was nothing but a big mouth who had no real say in hell. So take that, demon Hitler. But poor Annalisa is just wasting away at this point, And it's very frustrating to look at through the lens from the future, knowing that she could have been getting better medical treatment. But it's not like they did nothing. She was on medication and they were people of faith. They were doing what they believed would help. I get that. I really do. But by the 40th, 50th, 60th exorcism, <sighs> I'm struggling with that. Annalisa became so violent in some of these exorcisms that as her mother and father and the priests tried to restrain her, she snapped tendons in her body. She broke bones in her body. Annalisa would kneel in prayer for so long that she became disabled. Her body would ache and her legs and midsection and shoulders would cramp from staying in the praying position, not for hours, but for days. This poor woman was suffering. Regardless of what you or I think of the reasons that she was suffering, it's beside the point. She was suffering and she needed help. Annalisa's prayers were never answered. She never got better and she never felt free of the demons she believed were inhabiting her body. On July 1st, 1976, Annalisa Michelle died of malnutrition and dehydration that led to pneumonia. At the time of her death, she weighed only 66 pounds. She had two broken kneecaps from constant kneeling and she was unable to move at all without assistance. It was a terrible and slow and agonizing way to die and it just makes me very, very sad. As word spread of Annalisa's death, it reached the authorities. Many people in the town knew of the exorcisms that were being performed, but because they also knew they were supposed to be in secret, they didn't talk about them. Well, the death changed all of that, and the police were alerted as to what had been going on in the Michelle house. In the fall of 1976, the state charged Annalise's parents, along with Father Ernst Alt and Father Arnold Renz, with negligent homicide. Some people thought that was just, and others were outraged. The Michelles were represented in court by the very famous Nuremberg trial defense attorney, Eric Schmidt Leichner. The priests were defended by attorneys paid for by the Catholic Church. The trial began on March 30th, 1978, and it was a media sensation. People lined up for hours to try to get a seat in the courtroom. Everyone had a different opinion of what had happened, and people were very split on how they felt about Annalisa and her death. The prosecutor was actually somewhat sympathetic and did not ask for jail time for the two priests or the two parents. He asked only that the priests be fined and the parents found guilty, but not punished. I don't know how you find a priest. They don't have any money. Germany is very, very different from America. That would not be what the prosecutor would be seeking had that happened here. But I understand cultural differences. The prosecution brought in doctors who testified that Annalisa was, of course, not possessed. And they stated to the jury that manifestations of demonic possession are part of the mental disease Annalisa was suffering with. They cited her strict religious upbringing, her brain injury, which was never fully identified, and said that both of those things were complicated by her epilepsy, which they described as severe. At trial, it came to light that Father Alt had in fact contacted a medical doctor for help. Dr. Richard Roth was himself a very religious man, and it seems his religious beliefs took over his medical training. He had actually told Father Alt at one point, there is no injection against the devil. So Annalisa, she was really failed on many levels. The priests did ask a doctor for advice and that doctor gave them very bad advice. Annalisa's parents' attorneys argued that exorcisms are not illegal and that the German constitution protects German citizens from unrestricted exercise of their religious beliefs. The defense even played the tapes, part of which I played for you, to show the jurors and the judge how demonic Annalisa sounds in an effort to convince them that she was in fact possessed. Both priests testified and claimed that they heard the demons arguing between themselves. They claimed that the demons had come forward during the exorcism and identified themselves as Cain, Judas Iscariot, Belial, Legion, Nero, of course Hitler, and even Lucifer himself. Yes, the priests began claiming that they had, in fact, faced and fought Satan in their exorcisms with Annalisa Michelle. The priests also testified that Annalisa's death was a blessing for her because, you see, 
Just before she died, the demons were finally exorcised. I, I just, that makes me angry. Quite a coincidence, right? After 66 tries, you know, that the 67th try worked. I just, I'm sorry, that makes me angry. They said Annalisa was free and now that she was dead, she could rest in heaven. Bishop Stengel was questioned and he stated that he was not aware of Annalisa's disturbing health conditions when he approved of the exorcism. He claims he did not know that Annalisa was suffering from seizures or that she was on prescription medication for mental illness. He refused to testify in court, but did give statements to investigators. The whole trial was really a sensation and it kind of feels as though poor Annalisa's death was swallowed up by the extraordinary circumstances surrounding it. In the end, Annalisa's parents and Father Alt and Father Renz were convicted of negligent homicide, but they were given suspended prison sentences. They were ordered to pay part of the cost of the legal proceedings and they went on with their lives. The Catholic Church rightly drew a lot of criticism from the public and from the media. In the years that followed Annalisa's death, the German bishops would retract the claim that she was ever possessed and would agree that it was in fact a case of misidentification, that Annalisa was in fact mentally ill. Two years after Annalisa was buried, which apparently had been done very quickly, her parents had her body exhumed and placed in a new oak coffin lined with tin. Many people believed that the corpse would either show signs of no deterioration or that it would be more deteriorated from the demons. But in fact, the state of the corpse was to be expected for the length of time Annalisa had been buried. Neither the family nor Father Alt were allowed to view the body. Father Renz told the media that he had been barred from entering the mortuary at all. This terrible case had a great effect on the Catholic Church in Germany. Following the failed exorcism, the rules were tightened for exorcisms, and in 1999, Pope John Paul II enacted new guidelines, making exorcisms a very, very rare event. Annalisa's parents stood by their decision. They claimed that God told them to exorcise their daughter's demons and that they were following his commandments to do so. On June 6, 2013, an arsonist burned down the home where the exorcisms had taken place. The local police never caught the arsonist and the locals said they knew it was someone who wanted the ghoulish location gone. After Annalisa was reburied, she received this new headstone. Since her death, this grave has become a place of pilgrimage. People come from all over the world to stand and see the resting place of the girl who suffered so many years ago. And yes, if you're wondering, this is the story that served as the inspiration for the film, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. It's not a bad film, I've seen it a few times. In the end, this story just makes me feel sad. This was a young woman who was obviously in need of help and she was failed by everyone around her. They loved her and they used their faith to try and help her. But faith is a very tricky thing. When you rely only on faith, you relinquish control over your life. And to some degree, you can relinquish yourself of accountability for bad things that may happen when God doesn't give you the answer you want. Our court systems and our doctors don't rely on faith. They rely on science and justice. And if I was a gambling woman, that's where my money would go every time. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to my channel if you want to support me. You can also join my Patreon. It's really keeping the channel alive at this point. And uh, the long goal there is to be able to donate money to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that can't be tested because there's no money. We want to help with that. I sure appreciate you being here. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.